Holding to wholeness, supporting to security, and leading to maturity. And I want you to say that behind me. Loving to wholeness. Loving to wholeness. Supporting to security. Supporting to security. And leading to maturity. And leading and our, to maturity. And our motto is, we do life together. That's our motto, praise God. We believe that we are an intricate part of one body and that God will call us, amen, into the fellowship of the brethren and we'll call alongside of each other, amen, to do life together. Well, tonight we are going to go on and get started, praise God, because we are eager to bring the word of God forth tonight. And so we're gonna start with prayer. Prayer is very essential as it relates to the prophetic ministry because God undergirds everything with prayer. Praise God. And prayer moves the hand that moves the universe. And so at this time, we wanna call on one of our spiritual daughters, Dr. Deborah Curitan of Jehovah Shalom Ministries, She's going to lead us in prayer. Praise the Lord. We bless the Lord this evening, and we're so thankful that we are here to be a part of what God is doing. Let us compose our hearts as we go before the throne of grace. Oh, Father God, we magnify you. We glorify you in this place, Lord. We yes. lift you up, Lord God, as Jehovah Nisi. You are indeed the Lord God, our banner, Lord God. Lord God, we give you all the honor all the glory and all the praise for what you will do this evening, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for knitting our hearts and our minds together, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that we will carry forth, Lord God, the power, the authority that you have released, Lord God, upon your servants, Lord God, in this dispensation of time, Lord God. I ask in the name of Jesus, O oh Father, that you forgive us of our debts as we freely forgive our debtors, Lord. We thank you for leading us not to into a place of temptation, but delivering us from all evil. But thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory in Jesus' name, God. Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, according to, oh God, your plan for us this evening and throughout this conference, Lord God, that you will restore, Lord God, and that you will release, oh Father, the attributes, the hearts, the nature, the spirit, the life of the lion, of the tribe of Judah in Jesus' name name God. I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh Lord, that as fit lions with Jesus, the most beautiful, the greatest, and the most majestic war lion of all, that we are embodied by his spirit, Lord God, that we personify his image, Lord God. Lord God, when you created us, you made us, O oh God, according to your likeness, Lord God, according yes. to your image, O oh Father. Lord God, when you created us, Lord God, Lord Lord God, you said that we were very good, Father. So I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh Lord, that we, O oh God, receive our identity in this place, Lord God. I thank you right now, O oh God, that you created us in your image, O oh God, in your imagination, O oh God. Lord God, you, O oh God, imagine us, O oh God, to come forth, O oh God, and do that which you, O oh God, ordain us to do, O oh God. Lord God, I decree over us in this place, oh God, that we are not a people, oh God, that have lost our identity, oh God. We have not lost our purpose, oh God. Every plan that you have for us, uh, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11, oh Father, I thank you right now, oh God, that we receive it, oh God. Lord God, I thank you right now, oh God, that you would do great uh, and mighty things uh, in this place, oh God. I thank you right now, oh God, that the great lion's roar has set sound throughout the tribe and we in response to what we have heard oh god we are rising up we're coming forth oh god and we're doing that which you created us to do oh god lord god we're coming forth as a fierce warring family oh god our priority in this place oh father is to be one oh god even as the father the son and the holy spirit are one god i thank you oh lord that we will proceed 
personify the oneness of the triune God, oh Lord. I thank you right now, oh God, that we believe and we are receiving, oh God, every sign, every wonder, and every miracle, oh God, that you will release in this place, oh God, as you have knitted our hearts together, oh God. I thank you right now, oh God, that everything that will be done, oh God, in this campaign, oh God, during these three days, oh God, it will be done to glorify you, oh Father. We want your glory to be seen, oh God. We want your name to be released, Lord God. We want your spirit to be received, oh God. We want the fire of your anointing, oh Father, to fill this place like never before, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh Lord, that dull ears are open, oh God. Eyes will see, oh God, the spirit of the living God as you move, oh God, in the hearts, in the minds, oh God, of your people, oh God. Holy Spirit, we bless you in this place. We receive you, Holy Spirit. We thank you for the fire of your spirit. We thank you that you will be the teacher. We thank you that you will be the guide. We thank you that you will lead us into a place in our worship, in our press, in our praise, much higher than we've ever been before, God. Lord God, bless, oh God, Apostle Dara and Pastor Jack, uh, Pastor Beverly, God. Bless them, Lord God. Anoint them afresh in this place in Jesus' name, God. Let them carry out every assignment that you've given them with tenacity, with the relentlessness, God, that you, oh God, alone has given unto them, oh God, for such a time as this, God. Let your glory, oh God, be revealed, oh God, through the talk, the prophesied word, oh God, of every speaker, oh God, that will come forth and bring forth what thus says the Lord God. I thank you right now, oh God, that you, oh God, you, Father God, and only you can do, oh God, give them a authority, oh God, a boldness like never before in the name of Jesus, God. Give them revelation, give them wisdom, give them knowledge, oh God, give them understanding, Lord God, give them clarity, oh God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. I decree and I declare in the mighty name of Jesus, oh God, that as your prophets go forth, oh God, as your speakers go forth, oh God, I thank you right now, oh God, that they will hide behind the son of the living God, and he will be seen like never before in the name of Jesus, oh God. I thank you that ears are already prepared to hear, hearts are already prepared to receive in the name of Jesus. Now bless those that will gather in this place to receive everything that you will pour out, Lord God. Let this be an outpouring of your spirit in Jesus' name, God. Bless those, oh God, who will participate, oh God. Reward them for their faithfulness, Lord God. Let, oh God, let them know, oh God, that this is indeed ordained by you, God, and we will give you the glory and the honor and the praise, oh God. And Lord God, I would be remiss if I did not say this, God. Lord God, let there be a sowing like never before, oh God. Let seeds go into this soil that is fruitful and that will multiply and that will do good works for the kingdom of the almighty God. Lord God, I bless you and I I give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise for what you're going to do in this place uh, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Praise God. Amen. And praise God. We receive that. Thank you, Jesus. Receive the glory. Receive the honor. Receive the yes. praise. Praise God as we yield. Praise God into the uh, answer prayer. Praise God. Jesus said that man ought to always pray and not faint. And we thank God for that. Thank you, Apostle, for submitting to the Holy Spirit. That prayer came from heaven above. Praise God. We just thank God for that. With just a little bit more information as we get ready to receive the offer, the uh, Lions Conference campaign is literally a manifestation of a dream that God has given us. And this day, God is raising up dreamers of dreams and seers of vision. And praise God that uh, during your dream time, praise God, it's a gift to God. It's a gift to whatever spirit is speaking to you. Definitely a gift to God because all of your defenses is down 
and God is able to uh, plant the heavens in your spirit, praise God. And whatever God plant as a seed, praise God, God is already fruit and harvest in him. And so I had this dream. It took place in Birmingham, Alabama, Third Avenue and Center. And in this dream of the Lord, I, uh, I had walked Pastor Beverly out of a building and walked her to the bus stop and she got on the bus and she went home to Bessemer, Alabama. And I went back into the building when I was walking through the building, on the inside of the building was a beauty shop and a gymnasium all in one auditorium. And so I thought that was very interesting and very unique. So I walked through the gymnasium, I walked through the uh, gym, the uh, beauty shop, and I went down these steps and went back outside. When I went outside, to my amazement, what I saw was a lion's pride. I saw a lion's pride, and this pride was walking up uh, First Avenue and Center Street. I mean, yeah, uh, Center Street and Third Avenue. And I was just so amazed at the beautiful uh, glory of these lions. It just had captured me. And I was looking at the beautiful manes around the head and the tail and so forth, and they were together. And it was one that really, really stood out, stood out and it captured all of my attention. And I was just mesmerized. Then all of a sudden I thought, well, I better protect myself. So I went back in the building and then the dream, I woke up from the dream. And so without giving you the definition or the interpretation of the dream, I put together a Lions Conference manifesto. And I wanna read that manifesto to you guys so y'all can see what we're after. Our campaign is to restore and release the attributes, heart, nature, and spirit life of the lion of the tribe of Judah. As fit lions within Jesus, the most beautiful, greatest, majestic war lion of all, we are emboldened by his spirit to perform his image after his likeness and invisibility. I'm going to ask everyone to mute your phone, please. Uh, the great lion roar has sounded throughout the tribe. In response, the lions are rising and coming as one fierce warring family whose priority is being one and fulfilling the burdens of God's will for the generations to come. These lions are the miracles that God wants others to become. They are the apostolic models, examples, leaders, prototypes, and standards that will conquer God's enemy. These will restore the body of Christ to preservation of the miracles of protection and the provision and restitution of the good treasures and valuables of the spoils of war. The hallmark of lions is that the courage and the confidence by which they face all adversarial opposition and, ad and adversities will be from heaven. I want to say that again. The hallmark of lions is that the courage and the confidence by which they face all adversarial opposition and adversities will be from heaven. Their destiny is to be the king of the beast of the field in the earth in order to live the anointed lifestyle, realize their destiny in the supernatural, bring God the greater glory and demonstrate Satan's defeat. God's war animal anointing embodied by the attributes of the lions are coming. The lions are coming. The lions are coming. Praise God, that's our pronouncement, that's our declaration. Praise God from heaven and the interpretation of the dream that we have stood from God, praise God. At this time, uh, we were 
God gave us a theme uh, for this particular conference and its foundation for prophetic ministry. Praise God. And uh, what we're going to do now is get ready to give you the opportunity to be a financial blessing, praise God, to the Lions Conference campaign. And then after which we're gonna bring prophet Joe Brock up to minister the word of God. This individual, one of my spiritual sons, his name is Minister Cedric Bryant. He has the ministry of giving and he has really accelerated and matured in that ministry. God's infinite hand is upon him and he's a tremendous blessing to the body of Christ financially. And God has just really raised him up to learn how to receive. And it was as a result of a prophetic word that was released to him, he embraced that word, praise God, and acted on it by faith. And God has just been doing miracles and bringing things to pass one by one. So at this time, Minister Sarek, amen, you can lead us into receiving our Lions Conference uh, 2021 campaign offering. Praise the Lord, everyone. I'm going to, uh, uh, the Spirit has sort of guided me in this direction to talk about instances that, that grew my faith in the level of giving. Uh, what I found to be most unique is that, and I remember when I was growing up and I was uh, in a Baptist church and I began to look around and everything and, and, and everybody was barely getting by. And, and they were main attendees every Sunday. And I told the Lord, I said, well, I don't want to do that. And I mean, if you got to stay poverty your whole life, <laughs> just to serve that this doesn't add up. And then I began to, uh, God began to show me things and he began to take me down these different corridors of faith. And one of the corridors is that I got my first job when I got the military and I was making $10 an hour. And I told the Lord, that can't be me because that's not enough. And the Lord told me if I be faithful over a few things, He's going to make me a ruler over many things. And then he told me, he says, I want you to start sewing where you want to go. He says, I'm going to start you off in $10,000 increments. He says, if you make $30,000, sew like you make $40,000. If you make $40,000, sew like you make $50,000. And I did exactly that. And all of a sudden, this start stopped working when that 32 went to 42. And I said, Lord, this stuff works. You know, and that 42 went to 52. I just all I think I did was increase the seed. It's his job to provide the harvest. And then it got up to 70. I said, Lord, I'm loving this. And then I started saying, I want six figures, Father. I want six figures. And then God told me, you sold a house for 20000 You make 80000 Do your math. Don't dictate the manner in which I bring it to you. Your job is just to sow the seed and my bring the harvest and the revenues in which I will use to bring those harvests. And then he began to, to, to teach me. And I'd be like, Lord, I want a paid off car. I don't want a car payment. Anybody can get a car with a payment, you know? And, 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 and he began to tell me, he says, well, have you sown one? I said, no. He said, well, go buy your nephew a car that he'd been asking for. And I got my mom a van. I said, okay, I can do that. I, I sold both of those things. And I was in a church in Tennessee at the time. And then uh, all of a sudden, uh, I saw this beautiful, brand new, brand new Ford F-150 truck. And, uh, and the lady walks up to the uh, pulpit and say, Dr. Bryant, um, the Lord told me to give you this, um, this truck. And, and she gave me the truck. And the thing that was so unique about it is that I took the truck, because I asked for paid off Mercedes. I took the truck out to the Mercedes dealer and went and drove a Mercedes off the line with no payment. And I, I began to watch these things. And then I, I got to an area where I went to this church when I got back home called Pressing and that the sermon was pressing beyond the norm faith. Pressing beyond norm faith. And then I got this prophecy from uh, Prophet Brock that told me you're going to be a person in the relations to real estate. I said, oh, okay, I'll take that. But what happened, I sat on it for a while. And the Lord said, how long are you going to sit on it before you're going to take some actions? Faith without works is dead. So I began to take this situation and I began to apply things. And, and all of a sudden now, where I am, I have 13 properties, rental properties now. And God is just working this thing. And I thank uh, Prophet Bach for being used in that manner. But, but what really propelled most things is that, like things like 
when I go to a, a, a pastor's church or anywhere, I bless the man of God. God told me, always bless the head of the house, you know, give them honor and spirit in that location where they are. So, and, and he told me from now on, uh, see the word that you get from anyone. If you go wherever you go and that minister to your heart and you know that's you and you know I'm giving you that word, he says, see that ground, go in and receive that harvest. And everything was just, just falling in place to a level. And I kept asking, uh, I wanted to be vice president of human resources. And, I, and he told me to make up the certificate and post it on your wall. I did that. I made up the uh, little business cards, put it on that. And every time the president would walk in my office, I would point at that to him. I said, that's me right there, you know? And one day he came in and he said, you can take that down. I said, what's up? He said, you can go ahead and take that down. He gave me and promoted now to vice president of human resources. But what I would want people to do is that God is saying right now that we need to give outside of the norm. It's time to see sometime a little higher, so where we want to go. And, and, and I, I would love for, if you want to join, uh, uh, I want to go ahead and, and, and do that first pledge of $500 for the, for the ministry. And, and, and I just hope you're with me because now you got to realize God will deliver. You got you to gotta sow back into that word and not, and not knowing what you're left and right, and just sow and give all the time. I've learned that, that giving is gain. Every time I, somebody needs something, something happens and I begin to sow it. I get checks in the mail, deposit on cash app that I don't know where it's coming from. I don't try to judge where it's coming from. I let God sow that thing and just send it. So I, I, I ask you for this particular conference, Mighty Lions, that we sow outside of our comfort zone. God's got you. I promise you, you won't lose. I'm a rich child of a loving father, so I dare to prosper. All the doors are open unto me now. The whole wide world says yes to me. We have three ways in which we can give. We can give in the cash app, which is cash sign COFB, or we can give it by mailing it to Lions 2021, Post Office Box 0208, Bessemer, Alabama 35021, or we can give by text messaging by calling 204 293 one zero zero eight. I dare you to step out of that comfort zone and watch God give you the mantle of wealth in such a mighty and powerful way. Glory be to God, and that that you will become an inspiration to everyone around you. Thank you, Pastor. So, would you pray the prayer over the givers? Yes. Kind Father, all praise, honor, and glory be unto you. Father, you said in your word, you says, bring ye all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse. You didn't stop there. You said, give, and it shall be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Glory be to God. Father, you said in your word, there's some 30, some 60, some 100-fold return. Glory be to God. Give them a 100-fold mindset, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Expand and, and, and build their expectation up. I, I, as a hundredfold giver, and let's go a little higher. I hear your Holy Ghost a thousand times giver. Glory be God. And, and what God wants us to do is, is activate your level of faith. Step out there, glory be to God. God is saying that he's willing and open. Don't let the times of what's going on where you hear shortages, but the kingdom of God is never short. He's always got two fish and five loaves of bread. We can feed and see each other with the harvest that you, uh, that you have sown. Glory be to God. And Father, the, 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 the Holy Spirit said that the mantle of what fall upon you all and your children, your families, your business. He says, being a pastor of a church is one thing, but glory be to God, being a financial mongrel, glory be to God, mogul is enough to, to propel. He says, leaders understand that, 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 that this mantle of wealth is going to flow from the head down to down. So Lord God, he says, release right now that seed of faith, 500 plus. And then open the windows of heaven to you mightily. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Agreed, and it is so. In the mighty name of Jesus, thank you, son, for listening to God, obeying, and ministering through the ministry office of the giver. And for those who do not know that that's a ministry, that's a, a legitimate, viable ministry within the body of Christ. And that ministry is activated by the sound doctrine of the word of God and through a word of prophecy. Praise God could be confirmed. He, our minister Sarek, he ate up a message that we taught on for one year called Pressing Beyond the Norm. And because 
his appetite was for what God was revealing to him, there was a word of prophecy came and he ate that up, wrote it down. He worked with that prophecy, made decrees and so forth. He did his part and God moved and God moved in a mighty way, praise God. And so we decree a thousand times back to you in the name of Jesus, praise God. And Pastor Beverly and I would definitely uh, we're in on that 500 plus, praise God. At this time, with great honor and such a great privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, praise God. There's, um, he's been with me ever since 1991. And when Prophet Brock uh, received his revelation, vision from God to plant his local church, he came and sought me out in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, built a relationship with me, and we have been in covenant ever since of the heart. And we have had the privilege of covering he and his wife and their ministry from an apostolic perspective. We've had the privilege of traveling around certain parts of the nations together, I with him and he with me, and we have shared life together, praise God. And so I'm excited tonight to present to you our speaker for the first night, praise God, Prophet Joe Brock. We love him and we want you to welcome him in, praise God. Prophet, it's in your hands. Unmute, Prophet. Listen, I want to say grace and peace to everyone. What an absolute joy to be able to join you uh, via the internet concerning our Lions Conference. You know what I'm so grateful for, and I, I really appreciate that introduction by my bishop, and you know, he's absolutely right. I believe that accountability and relationship when you're dealing with the apostolic and the prophetic is so necessary for this hour. So therefore, many of the places that I would travel, I would ask either he, um, Bishop Jackson, or Pastor Beverly to go, go with me, and she's flown with me, he has flown with me, and we've gone around the in many places in the country just representing the uniqueness of the apostolic and the prophetic because I always wanted the people to know um, that I was accountable to someone. Some places I found myself, they asked me to come in once a month for a few years, and but I always wanted them to understand if anything jump off that is unique, please feel free to pick up the phone and call. I just wanted to emphasize that because in this day and time when Bishop said we're doing life together, what an absolute blessing. Listen, tonight I have something that I want to share with you that um, when we began to pray about this conference, we understood that the foundation of prophetic ministry was a very necessary thing. And it's, re it's necessary for three things. It's because inside of every person, God has established and has established the nature of prophetic ministry to come forth to serve him diligently and for us to walk in a prophetic nature as we're being taught and increase. And one of the ways in which you're going to see that, I'm just going to tell you about it rather than just kind of walk you through, but please make note of the scripture. I believe that when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ began to commission us to tell us very, very truly, truly, I say unto you the works that I do, shall you do also in greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. If you remember, in the earth, he was doing his work as a prophet. He was doing his work as a priest, and he was doing his work as a king. As a king, he was showing heavenly authority. He was not content just to talk about it, but he healed the sick, raised the dead. He proved that the father was the witness with him. The second thing that was so important is that he was also a priest. Now, can I tell you that between the prophet and the priest, you see, excuse me, of, of, of the king and the priest, you see something very powerful in Revelation 1 and 7, and he has made us unto our God kings and priests. What about the priest? If you look at Exodus chapter 19, when you have a moment later on this week, or when you're studying that, you'll notice that the Lord summoned for his people to come meet him, and he, they were in the wilderness, and he said to them, you see what I've done unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Guess where he was? And guess where they were? They were in the desert. It doesn't matter where you are, 
when the Lord summons you and you answer that call, what a glorious thing. But when you come there and you read that, you'll hear something very unique. You hear him say unto them, he says, listen, for your peculiar treasure unto me. Then he says, for all the earth is mine. Then he says these words, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Listen, the corn Levitical priesthood was very powerful. But the Lord always wanted a, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Everything that he said in Exodus chapter nine and chap, chapter 19. Same thing concerning kings. He, uh, we, we appreciate David. We appreciate those who came in the lines of the king. But the Bible says he's the king of kings. We are those kings that he is the king of. And for years, as I have shared that, I've always wanted you to understand that God has chosen us in himself and made us, look at this, a threefold core. We are a prophetic, priestly, kingly group of people. The anointing that is upon us, the enemy never wants us to maturate, to grow up in it, because he recognized the moment that we do, there's absolutely nothing he can do in the saints. So I believe the grace of what you're going to begin to hear coming forth out of the apostolic and the prophetic is the realization of the unique things that God has called us to. Tonight, I'm gonna to deal with prophetic foundation. I said to you that Jesus was a king, he was a priest, and he was a prophet. In a few moments, I'm gonna show you something that's very unique. It is at the time when Moses, he was doing this tremendous laborious work. And if you remember, he was just it was just tedious and he had to get wisdom from his father-in-law. But remember the Lord told Moses, I'm going to take of the spirit that is upon you and put it upon 70 elders. You'll find that in Numbers chapter 11. And God did exactly that. And then he called that assembly out into himself. But there were two men that remained in the camp. One was Eldad, one was Medad. And they were so fond of this new anointing that they remained in the camp and was prophesying. Now listen to me because I'm going to get to the crux of what I'm after before we begin to delve, uh, dive into scripture. And those two men were there. And so one of the runners ran and told Moses, he said, Moses, uh, El Dad and me there are in the camp and they are prophesying. And, 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 and Aaron, and listen, he said, Lord, my Lord Moses, forbid them. And the next word that came out of Moses' mouth let you know that not only did he want a kingdom of kings and a kingdom of priests, but he also wanted the kingdom of prophetic people because what came out of his mouth next is so profound. And he says, envious for my sake, would God all the Lord's people were prophets. And here's the key. And that he would put his spirit upon them. But I want to tell you something. That was not an Arsenio Hall moment with a heavenly. Hmm. No, it was already ordained that the Lord would put his spirit upon man. And in Joel 2 and 28, it shall come to pass afterwards, I shall pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. And it goes on, and what he's basically telling us, I'm going to put a prophetic nature on, on you, that you will relate to me out of the sensitivity of how you've seen the prophets flow, how you've seen that grace and anointing. Was he ordaining all of us to be prophet? No, he was ordaining us to be a prophetic people who would operate, I want you to write this down, please, who would operate in the multifunction nature of when he says your sons and daughters shall prophesy. I want to give you a few words I want you to, when you get a moment to look up. When he says your sons and daughters shall prophesy, here's what he's saying, your sons and daughters shall harvest, harvest. They shall be given to dreams and visions and knowings in their spirits. They're going to come to a place where I'm going to deal with them in the night vision. Why? Because I want to show them things about themselves. I want to show them things about others that I want them to minister for them to benefit on. And I need them to understand. I need them to be in a contemplative place so that they would recognize with Haza, I need them to be seers and dreamers because I'm pouring my spirit out upon them because there's another place that they're going to come to a place where they begin to, this is the part of that word, perceive. And as they are perceiving, 
I want them to understand that I'm pouring my spirit out upon them because I need them as sensitive as the prophets are. I need them to flow in this grace where they can be dreamers. They can see vision for the day visions and night visions. And I can use them to minister the words of life those for whom I purpose that they come in contact with, but that's the only word that's in there. He's a cause of, but then he also said, you will also be like the Nabis, those who will bubble forth, those who will be like the roar of the Ruah, those who will be seers, those who will be able to see, understand, discern, because they have the Holy Spirit upon them, be able to live by the force of the Holy Spirit. They will also walk in the spirit of Nebois, N-E-B-U-W-A-H. You know what that means? They'll understand the Logos, the word of the Lord, but they'll also be open to Ramah, Rama, the word of the Lord that will come upon them and crown them. When I pour my spirit out upon them, they shall N-A-T-A-P or N-A-T-A-P the thought. What does that mean? They're going to ooze and gradually distill. Why? Because when they come before me in my presence, they're going to absorb the very essence as of who I am as the father of light. You know, you know who that happened with? Moses. Moses spent 40 days in the presence of the Lord, and he, he, he began to absorb the Lord. And when he came back before the people, he was oozing. He was gradually distilling. It was dripping through his pores, the glory of the Lord. And what I want you to know is built into this prophetic nature that God has called you to. He has raised up the prophets and the apostles to begin to encourage you not only to understand the fundamental foundations, but it is necessary that we recognize that in our God's plan, in his purpose, and you go back and you search this out with the prophet Samuel, God placed the prophets in the Old Testament in very strategic places. They were in four major cities, actually five, but I'm only going to deal with four very briefly here. They were in a city called Bethel. What does Bethel mean? It means the house of God. I believe if you look at Ezra chapter five, just write this down, Ezra chapter five, you'll discover that when they were building the house of God, what were they building? The house of God, the Bible says, and the prophets were with them helping to build. The prophetic voice is a necessary ingredient inside of every house. And I need you to understand how valuable that is. But the other place that they dwell was a place called Gilgal. It's one of the first places that the children of Israel feasted when they came across to inherit or to take the land that God had given them. And when it says feasted, you have to know this. It also means wheel. It means rolling. And what we see in the significance of that prophetically, and I just want to address this very briefly here with you, is that God has hidden a whole lot of unique prophetic things in feast times. The fall feast, the spring feast, the more deems, the times and the seasons. And everything that he did, including Jesus becoming the, the sacrificial lamb, the time that he died, it was all planned out meticulously, and we saw them through the parallel of a feast. We saw 50 days after his resurrection, as he stayed on the earth 40 days, 40 nights, teaching about the kingdom. And then finally, he was taken up to heaven, and on the 50th day, Shavuot, on Pentecost, he came back in the persons of the Holy Spirit. We look and we see now that we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit. We have received the measure of a kingdom. And then when you go into the fall feast, young to rule, when you look at um, uh, from, from the fall feast, young to poor, and, and ultimately you come all the way down to tabernacles, God is telling you, I've saved you, I've empowered you, you are a threefold cord, man. And I'm strengthening you and I'm teaching you through the prophetic apostolic. Why? I filled you with my spirit that's going to lead and guide you into all truth because you got a harvest of people that you're going to have to bring in into the fold. And I need you to be equipped, apt, and ready to bring that harvest into the fold. Beloved, having said all of that to you, I want you to take a journey with me.
And I want you to listen to this out of the strength of what the Father has been speaking that I want you to hear. Turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 10. One of the things that is so unique to prophetic ministry and the prophetic voice is for the prophets that the Lord have raised up in this hour. Not only does he want them speaking into the body of Christ, but there are multiple mysteries from Daniel chapter 9. When Daniel was told coming to the end of that chapter to set up the prophecies, they were for a time of the end. Well, that time came, some of that time that Daniel talked about Messiah, Messiah coming and what he would bring, but it also spoke beyond that time. And there are many things that from the prophetic perspective that we are supposed to share with you. And he also says right here, and I want you to pay close attention to this because I want you to take a meticulous walk with me. And in the middle of this, you're gonna understand something that I think the Father wants us to understand so we can realign ourselves and get focused and make sure that we don't get entrapped in the spirit of confusion. Here it is. And in verse uh, one, starting with Revelation 10, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as if the sun, watch this, his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his right hand a little book. You see that? A little book open. And, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth or on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice. Underline this, if you would, please, because I believe the lions of the tribe of Judah is roaring. But one of the ways that he is roaring, he's roaring through his servants who are speaking his order in this hour. But listen to this. And he says, and. And, a, and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Circle that in your Bible, seven thunders uttered their voices. Can I tell you that now is the time to take the enigma and the mystery out of many things God spoke. And God is doing that with his prophets and apostles. But because God is doing that with his prophets and apostles, it has made them tremendous targets as it relates to the plans of the wicked one. But I'm not going to deal with that now. Let's keep reading here. And the next part of this, he says in verse three, and he cried with a cry with a loud voice as when a lion roared. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, let's keep going. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voice, which they were heralding a mystery, he said he was about to write it down, which meant he heard it and he understood it. And here's what he said. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things, seal up those things. Now remember this, this is after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and things are being given that must be explained and will be explained, I believe, by fundamental foundational ministry. And the enemy is doing everything in his power to hinder that, but he will not have victory. Now keep reading here with me. He says, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hands to the heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and who created heaven and the things that there, uh, that there are in, uh, therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things uh, which are therein. Listen very carefully. He says that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seven angels. Now, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he had declared it to his servants, the prophets. Are you hearing me? I want you to underline that. The mystery of God should be finished as he has declared it unto his servants, the prophet. I want you to hear that. And I want you to take just for a few moments and hear this, if you would. There's a lot of things that God has said concerning prophetic ministry. Believe my prophets, so shall you do what? At home, I know you're shouting, prosper. The Lord said, I'll do nothing except I first reveal my secret unto my servants, the who? Prophets. Turn with me to the book of Acts, please. And in Acts chapter 3, 
I just want you to follow me just here for a little bit. And I want you to listen to an involved mystery here. And with this involved mystery, it's going to speak something that you're already aware of, but we're going down to the 19th verse. And if you would systematically follow me here, I'm going to read this. It says this, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. I'm going to read that very slow. And he shall send Jesus Christ, listen at this, which before was preached unto you, we have received from them, whom the heaven must receive, retain, hold on to, until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. I'm painting a picture for you here. The modern day prophet has a responsibility to you as the body of Christ. We have a responsibility before God that when we speak to you to bring clarity. For years now, for decades, when I go into a church, I don't go into a church to usurp the authority of the pastor. I go to strengthen their hands. I make sure that when I'm going, I'm hearing something from the Lord that blesses, that encourages, that helps them do their portion in ministry. Hold fast to that. Now, Jesus is held now in the heaven. When I say it, ain't nothing restraining him, it's in this physical. But he's looking for some things to come to pass, which God has spoken by the mouth of his prophet. Once again, I'm going to pause right there and say, pay attention to that. The prophetic, the apostolic role have a very important part, but not such a part that we're irreplaceable or all knowing, but such a part for which I believe there's no substitute for what true prophetic brings to the table. Look down at verse 25 in this same chapter. I want you to see this. In other words, look at 25 and notice, well, I'll start at 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that followed after as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Listen at this. You are the children of the prophet. Why on earth am I pointing this out to you? In the year 2020, as we've just navigated through the 2021, many of the things the Lord began to prophesy to us back in the New Testament, as you begin to talk about wars, rumors of wars, plagues, things of that nature, we witnessed something come upon the nation in a way that was literally second to none. And when we saw that, one of the things that was very necessary is for the prophetic voices to begin to come forth for the purpose of helping us through what was a time of, write this word down, transition, transition. Now, for the sake of time, I want you to remember this. Whenever transition comes and it's major transition, God always looks and he speaks to his prophetic voices. He uses his apostolic voices to help people navigate through that. I can direct your attention to Acts chapter 15 for you to write this down. Same book here. And when there had been the Judaizers who had come to town and they were trying to compel all men and every man who considered themselves a Christian that they were going to have to be circumcised in the way of Moses. And it created no small dispute. And so what they ended up doing is they had a great council and they made some very qualified prayer field decisions that they would stick to certain things. They don't walk, you know, don't deal with things, um, uh, polluted meats and don't walk in fornication. But they also decided that circumcision which God had given was no longer going to be of the flesh, but it was going to be of the heart. Now, listen to me very carefully. This church in Antioch where Paul and Barnabas was a prophet and apostle, this Gentile church was growing. And I want you to see this picture that the church is in transition now. And so now they come to a place in Acts chapter 15. And as a matter of fact, I don't want to turn there, but I'm going to give you the exact verse. In Acts 15 and 22, what you look at there, it tells you that then it pleased the elders along with all of the men, the, the people that were there in the church, 
after they had made this decision, what they were going to speak was to send two men of their own company. The Bible calls them chief men among the brethren. Silas, whose surname was Bar uh, Judas, whose surname was Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. Two individuals to now take this word to the new Gentile church because the church is in transition, transitioning into the revelation of what God is after now. And so they chose these two men, chief men among the brethren. These are individuals who, who are known by them, and they wanted them to go to Antioch to convey this word. Who were these two men, Judas and Silas? We know Silas accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. Well, all you have to do, write this down, is Acts 15 and 32, and here's what you're going to read. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, went there and they strengthened those brothers. The prophetic voice is necessary. Making a point here for you. That means it's going to get attacked. The enemy is going to desire to dilute it because he understands something about prophetic and apostolic ministry. Let me show it to you in scripture. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Acts. I mean, Ephesians, please. In Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to look at this and pay close attention to this. And answer this question in your own heart and own mind. Because right now, we stand right on the verge of some of the greatest breakthrough, some of the greatest healing miracles, revivals to take place. And God has purpose that we understand a unique thing that he has placed within the body of Christ. Now, I don't want you to take this wrong or take this harshly. But the Lord is calling the church to order. Because many have separated themselves from the foundation of what God put in the church as foundation. You say, what is that, Pastor Brown? The prophetic and the apostolic. For many generations now, we've been out of order. Somebody take a notion, I want to start a church. They just go grab a group of people, start a church, have no relationship with apostolic fathers, have no relationship with prophetic voices. And as a result of that, they're able to put names over their doors, even grow at times, but it's been out of order. During the unique reset that we have been in, the Lord is now emphasizing the true relationship to the apostolic and the prophetic voice. And I want to show you this here in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. I want you to remember this. And here's a mystery that goes along with it. Now, in 19, here's what it says. He says, now, therefore... You are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now watch this. And are built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see that? In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple in the Lord. Apostolic fathers and apostolic mothers, prophetic fathers, prophetic mothers were designed to help us to come to a place that in some way, shape, form, and fashion, every church, I don't care where they are, should have an apostolic and a prophetic voice if they're relating to why, because they're part of the foundation. Well, you're smart. I know you're smart and you're probably saying, well, Pastor Brock, according to Ephesians chapter 3, the Bible says that no other foundation can be laid than that which is already laid. Who is that foundation? Shout it out while you're at home. Jesus Christ. But let me show you a mystery. Because there's something I need you to know about you and I. We are the house of God, the temple of God. And God is building his temples that he is occupied, he's living in, the Holy Spirit is living in. So I want you to look at this, if you would, here in the book of Luke chapter 6. And this is how uh, an, an absolute powerful mystery in which God was teaching them through his son about building a house. You look at two houses that were built. There were those who did not pay attention to the word, did not have a relationship uh, with the depth of a true foundation, and the house was built on sand. Now, for years, I used to think it was a shabby house, and then I saw this glorious house. 
And one day when in a vision caught up by the Lord, I realized those houses didn't look any different from one another. Some of them were humongous houses built on sand. But the key here is, and here's a mystery concerning the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. Go with me here and drop all the way down. We're going down in the 40s here. And as we go down, I want you to pay close attention to this. Um, and I want you to listen to the very nature of what the Father speaks here. As to in verse 47, he says, Whoso cometh, whosoever cometh unto me and hear these sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, listen closely, and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Here's the mystery of this passage of scripture. The reason the Bible can call the apostolic and the prophetic foundational is because the apostolic and the perfection uh, and the prophetic will always dig deep. They will dig deep until they find the rock of Jesus Christ and they will lay their foundational nature upon that rock so that when they come up and allow folks to begin to build, what they begin to build comes straight from the rock of salvation, the chief cornerstone. And they had to dig deep to get down there. Why? Because they knew they were building a house that the storms were going to come against, that it would be vehemently pushed against. But they had to build a house that was tempered by the word of God and that could stand forever. The this is so serious here. There is no other foundation but one foundation. That's Jesus. And whoever comes must lay on him. And if I was Lucifer, I would do my very best to target that apostolic and prophetic ministry because I know how serious they are. Let me let you peek at something here. I want you to turn over here with me to the book of Revelation. I just want you to peek at this one thing uh, right quick, if you would, for me. It won't take but a moment. Jesus. You to go with me, excuse me, to the book of Revelation. Just take a peek at this. Let me show you how important when the Lord said the apostolic and the prophetic are foundational. Look at this and, and you'll see the mystery there that the thing is you can have the two foundations, but there's only Jesus Christ who is the main foundation and you lay that apostolic and prophetic on there. And you know when they speak because they're going to speak with the witness of the word behind them. They're not going for excess. They're not going for wildfire. But what they say can and will be proven. Again, if I was Satan, I would hit them hard. Look at Revelations, if you would, please. And we're going to 21st verse, 21st chapter. We're going down to the 14th verse. I want you to remember this because built into this, and I'm laying a foundation here for something that I need you to remember. In the 15th, in the 14th verse, I want you to listen to this very closely and tell me what you see unusual about this. And the walls of the city had 12 foundations. Underline that. The wall of the city had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. When God said they're foundational, these apostles found themselves on the rock. And these 12 men turned the world right side up in their diligence before God. And God calls them foundational and gives the eternal witness in heaven how foundational the apostolic and the prophetic voice is. There were 12 foundations. And each one of those foundations had the name of the apostles. That's pretty serious. Now go here with me, if you will. I need you to hear that. I need you to remember this. We have been in one of the greatest level of warfares of late that we've ever been in before. What has taken place is that the enemy was after to take the prophetic and the apostolic voice rather than letting them off them laying on the foundation when they were designed to get frustrated and speak out of agendas, spin points, anything 
um, but being laid against the foundation of Christ. I have to stop and slow this down for you because what I want you to know, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. But why would the enemy come so hard after the prophetic and the apostolic to such a degree that men and women could not put each other in check about what you were saying, especially coming in 2020, the different things that we witnessed and people became so confused. I had prophetic sons and daughters who called me and said, uh, Pastor, uh, some said fatherless, spiritual father that is they said what's going on they had no understanding because of all the things that the prophets begin to say prophets begin to do i can tell you unequivocally it breeded such confusion that people were tormented we were never designed to do that with the body of christ but lucifer understood the fundamental foundational part that we played with the body of christ i had some people so thoroughly confused and even to this day, they're waiting for the previous administration to go back into the White House as if there is some type of constitutional provision that causes that or will cause that to be. And any prophetic or apostolic voice that is heralding that right now, I would very carefully say to them, start digging, start digging, and don't stop till you hit the rock. And make sure that's what the Lord is saying. Because the concept is that what is taking place is many don't realize they're sowing seeds of anarchy and confusion in the people. Because to really say, as I've heard some continuously say, we do not have a president, even though the same process has been going through the, uh, the college and everything to bring one forth. Things have been challenged now. Don't try to judge me on politics. I have none. But I've been watching with a very unique eye. I've taken a very unique eye to what's been taking place and I realized all we had to do was do our spiritual due diligence to search things out out of the nature of Christ. And so there are some that are still waiting for that to happen. And there are some who believe that by any means necessary there to put him there, that's a spirit of a seed of anarchy that has been sown. And the apostolic and the prophetic was the only somebody that could sow that to the degree that it would bring confusion. And my father says, listen, tell them, dig deep and find the sun, the rock, and see if that's what he's saying, why? Because you just made him, the father and the Godhead, say technically, we can suspend our constitution, we have no laws, we have no rules of authority, everything is out of order, which creates a spirit of anarchy, you can do whatever you wanna do. Now, I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody in particular. Why am I dealing with this? Because I understand why Lucifer attacks the prophetic and the apostolic. He understood how fundamentally foundational they were for the body of Christ and its stability. So much so that when I look at the book of, of Psalms chapter 11, I want you to just turn there. You won't have to be there but for a moment. Turn to Psalms chapter 11. And take a note of this because this is pretty, pretty serious in the fact that when you go down to that third verse, it makes this statement here. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's a serious statement. And the fact of the matter is, it's a serious statement because nevertheless, according to 2 Timothy 2 and 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God has not changed. It's still standing sure. Are you with me? And when you go there and read this with me, I want you to look at this in 2 Timothy 2.19. The, the foundation of the Lord has not changed. And what has happened is that uh, what took place uniquely so is that something began to happen that understood the value of dividing us. Can I tell you that I've never had a president in office that I believe 100% was perfect or 100 uh, was evil. I believe that I praised what they did positive and prayed for what they needed to put in check. That's the best way you can approach this. But if you believe under any circumstance, God is going to applaud that which is good and say, hey, amen, and, and say, well, I'm going to ignore this other stuff over here. Dig deep. 
that's what's happening now. During this reset, God has summoned us to dig deep. I want you to look at this in verse 19 in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 19. It says, nevertheless, and here's what I want you to hear. The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But he goes on. And he makes this statement, and I want you to look at it with me. Just go down just a few more verses in verses 24 and 25. And he said, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. You know, I've always known that if you are spiritual, as I know that God has many people spiritual, we do not threaten with weapons and we do not threaten uh, with carnal things because that's not the weaponry of our warfare. The prophetic and the apostolic ministry is so foundational that there's a brother that I know by the name of Dr. Kingsley Fletcher, who has written a book called If I Were Satan. And I believe it was Paul Harvey has something you can look up when we get off this airline, off this air, and it says, if I was Satan, I need you to receive this with me. The reason God put the apostolic and the prophetic to be a part of the church and every church is because you remember what he said in 1 Corinthians 12 and 28? I said in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. Why? because I put within them as well as all the other ministry folds, but I want them to dig deep and find the rock and lay and minister life, insight, revelation, and even rebuke to the body of Christ. God is not opposed to himself. He's not an anarchist. And because of the day and time that you and I are living in, I've got to, I've got to share this with you and I want you to hear this. raising of apostolic forces who are not looking to condemn others based upon what they believe of their mistakes, but are going to give a clear direction as to being able to solve the mystery of Daniel chapter nine. I can tell you right now that revelation is available to us. What the seven thunder said, that revelation is available to us. But God needs us in a position where we can refocus. And as we are refocusing, we come to a place where he can speak the abundance of the uniqueness of his revelations so that he can bring us into the place that you understand something. Write this down. From the beginning of time, when you and I were created in the garden, God created us in such a way we were in a human body, the scripture says, right? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and that, it makes the statement, how be it that which was first was not spiritual, but natural. We were in a natural body. Do you know if we had not sinned, we would have lived forever in a natural body? Don't let that shock you. Don't let that shock you. What if I tell you that after the fall, we became subject to poverty, sickness, disease, and death, and they were never designed to be a part of the human equation. They were never designed to be a part of the human equation. But God has been meticulously. We had a genesis which he created us, male and female. We had a degenesis or degeneration where we failed. But if you remember the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he said, those of you who have walked with me through the regenesis or the regeneration. He made covenantal promises. Now I want you to pay very close attention to something. In Hebrews chapter 11, there's something here that's fundamental to the faith that I need you to understand that the Father is walking us back past every enemy that you and I became subject to in the Garden of Eden. And he's using faith to
to do it. Now, I need you to hear this from this perspective because we are rebuking sickness, disease. We are rebuking death. We are given so it can be given unto us so that we can affect the kingdom and cause increase in the land. But pay attention to this. I'm almost done. And I need to pray this over you so that you'll understand that there's a great roar that's about to come from the prophetic. It's not going to be pointing fingers at people. It's not going to be talking um, uh, about political things, or, but it's going to give you the insight and revelation of end times. You're going to hear the revelation of Revelations 13 in a way that would make sense to you, the number of the beast and what that really means, as opposed to the sci-fi phenomenon that has been applied for many people that they are looking for an antichrist to raise up in this earth as if that's the will of God. It's not. If you look here at the book of Revelation, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, listen to this. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. How smart is Paul if he wrote this? I believe he did. Paul said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Do you know that at the end of this, he then turns around and says the evidence of things not seen. Listen to me very closely. Paul defined the word hope for at the end of this passage of scripture. When you look in the book of Romans chapter 8, he tells you, why do you hope the things that you see is what you see not? So look at this. It says, now faith is the substance of things not seen and the evidence of things not seen, or it could have read, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things hoped for. Keep that in mind. For by it, for by it, uh, through faith, we understand that the world were framed uh, by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made but those things which do appear. It goes on, it talks about eight, but watch this if you will. Here's what I need you to drop down to drop down to verse five and write this down drop down to verse five i want you to listen prophetically to the systematic way in which the faith that he gave us was going to help us overcome poverty sickness and disease and ultimately rebuke the last enemy death as christ reigns in us stop and listen just for a moment I say, Pastor Brock, why would you say that? I'm saying it because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made it that if we did not have the privy of the full depth of the revelation, that the grave and death would no longer have its victory. You understand that? And its sting would be rendered unaffected. But if you listen at this very carefully, the reason that faith teaching was so important is because God had determined faith that evidential substance that comes forth with an insight and a prophetic revelation to walk us past every part of the curse of the law. When I look at this, when I see this in verse five, he's starting with the, with the, with the worst one. He says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see what? Death, underline that, death. And was not found because he, was translated for for his translation he had this testimony he pleased God but without faith it is impossible to please God don't stop keep listening for he that cometh to God must believe that he is you stop that right there you could have put two dots there because faith is teaching you who he is the woman that has the issue of blood heard that he is a what Healer. She went diligent, diligently after him. And she said, listen, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, she knew she was putting her life on the line. They knew her in that town. She was walking with the very man that could have condemned her. But that faith was so strong inside him. She touched the hem and virtue left without him even looking. Whosoever cometh unto him must believe that he is. How do we teach them and teach you who he is? Through the principles of faith. We teach you that he is indeed prosperity. We teach you that he is a healer. We teach you he is the one who has conquered death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Whether it's you who succumb and go with the Lord 
or whether we fight and tell the devil, no, we're going to be here till the Lord comes. There is a mindset that is emerging among us now that faith was designed to bring us to and through and into. So he starts here with Enoch, and he tells you that Enoch was translated that he should not see that. Why? Because Enoch walked and talked with God. The conversation got so good, the Lord said, come up here, son. Watch this. Who in the world is Enoch? Enoch is the father. Just, just track this just for a moment with me. Of Methuselah. Methuselah, at a time when lifespan were going down, just simply going down, here is a man, Enoch, who walked and talked with God, and as he walked and talked with God, something happened. His very seed inside of him produced someone that for the first time, rather than the things taking a dip, did walk and talk with God, caused lifespans to excel and come higher. Why? Because that's the order and what faith will do on the inside of you. For the first time, life didn't take a dip. It went up. It went up. And I'm submitting that to you. Why? Because he walked and talked with God. This is what faith is doing. And from there, we see that Enoch was translated. He had this testimony. He pleased God because whosoever cometh unto him must believe that he is and that he is a reward of those that diligently do what? Seek him. You hear that? Now, let's keep going through here. And I'm not going to read all of this. Look at verse 8. Enoch overcame death. I said poverty, sickness, disease, and death. Abraham became prosperous by hearing the word of the Lord. He didn't have a scroll. He heard what God said, get thee out of the land of your father. Get thee out of the land of earth. And he made him a covenantal promise in Genesis 17. He, he expedited it further in Genesis 22. But listen here. Abraham obeyed him, got out of the land, and became one of the most prosperous men in the world. Received Type to Melchizedek. Melchizedek, who came with Jesus in his hand, bread and wine. That's another story. But watch this. He became prosperous by listening to the word of faith, hearing and obeying God. Thank God he's now come in the volume of the book, Hebrews 10 and 7, this previous chapter. And now he's teaching us. But watch this. Abraham became prosperous. How? Through faith. Let's keep going. Watch the next one here. When you drop all the way down to verse 11. And Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful and promised. She had to come to that point because she laughed and mocked the first time. That mocking gave birth to the enemy that Israel faces today of the Hebraic children, their own brothers and sisters. But she overcame the declension that was in her body menopause, the, the, the natural declension that was happening when the Bible says she was past the years. What's going on? Faith. How did they hear it? God told them, listen to me, believe me, hear my voice. He renewed her womb. Abraham became prosperous. Enoch walked past death. Why? By faith. We're on a journey here. And it's not a journey of just stay saved until he comes or we get to heaven. We're on a journey that eventually got to stop the enemy in his tracks while we are yet fearing 666 and the Antichrist. God injected us into the earth to make a difference. All I have to tell you to do is when I look at Daniel chapter 7 and see that same amalgamated system coming up out of Daniel 13, I got to remember what happened to that beast system over in the book of Daniel 2. Thou sawest till a stone was hewn out of the mountain and break in pieces all these other kingdoms. Don't you find it interesting that in the next chapter here, Paul's going to say, we haven't received a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us serve God with reverence and godly fear our God as a consuming fire. You and I on the day of Pentecost received the kingdom as living stones, and now God is making us one, a stone that will do battle with any force coming in the earth. I'm not sure how we came to the conclusion 
of worrying and waiting for an antichrist to show up to put us in bondage when that's not what our God called us to. God told us that the, the sea of people and nations and tongues would give rise to a system that would put them in bondage. I would get to that, but I, I'm not, not going to try to deal with that tonight to explain to you how it started when we came off the gold system, how we got money as a system of financial money, a promissory note, and now we're going to, I believe, money with big color. That's another story. I have no issue with it. But watch this and listen very closely to me. I want you to understand that an antichrist in the earth ruling and reigning was never God's plan when he had injected us in that as long as we are in the earth, there's no way possible for him to purposely just turn the earth over to the devil. Perhaps in our maturation, we need to read differently or see exactly what he's saying. And I'm gonna stop there because of the sake of time. But get back to this. Anna overcomes death. Abraham becomes prosperous. Sarah over the declension of, of natural sickness in her body. How powerful through faith. But watch this miracle here as we keep reading. Watch this. These were very powerful ministries. But look at verse 13 and watch this mystery unfold for you. Prophetically, I'm telling you, it's a mystery because of what he said. The scripture says here, these all died. Look up that word all, it's the all inclusive all. In faith, when they heard the word, believe God, having not received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were pilgrims and strangers on the earth. Not us. They are. Are you hearing me? For they that say such thing declare plainly that they seek a country. And if truly they had been mindful of that country from which they had came out of, they might have had opportunity to return. Now, back up to 13 first. And these all died in faith. It'll slip right past you if you're not careful. What do you mean these all died in faith? Did Sarah die? Yes. Yeah. Was she buried? Yeah. What about Abraham? Did he die physically? Yeah. Buried? Yeah. What about Enoch? Did he die? Oh, hold up, hold up. Did I get something wrong? No, I didn't. Listen to me. Yes, he did. But he didn't die the same type of death they died. Enoch died the death that you and I if we want to receive the fullness of the resurrection in our lifetime, he died the type of death that you and I must die. It's a death to every voice, but the voice of God. When things are coming upon the earth, our hearts don't fill us, fill us with fear, looking after those things. Why? We're children of faith. We were set here to make a difference. The apostolic and the prophetic voices are teaching us the quality of faith. And don't get this twisted. Some people say, well, you just need to comfort the people so that when people transition and go into heaven, that they'll be okay. Yeah, that's fine. We're going to do that. But guess what else? Faith doesn't stop at talking about having taken the steam and the victory out of death and the grave. Faith continues to tell you to walk with God. But why? Because I'm working out life inside of you while creating death. Enoch was a man who was as good as dead. How dead was he? He was so dead that the Bible can say these all died. Wait a minute. Pastor Joe, he didn't die. Yeah, but God said he did. Then you got to ask yourself, what kind of death did this man die? That God can include him with Abraham and Sarah. He died the death you and I have to die. To every voice but the voice of God. To everything that's coming, listen, we now have the word of faith that is our focus. We've had so many authors to paint for us a picture of defeat and, and just a horrible time in which believers are worried about things we should never have been worried about. Can I submit to you, how dead should we be? Listen, 
I'm just about done. We should be as dead as Lazarus was. Say, Pastor Bronx, what do you mean? You go back and read the story. When the Lord told him, I'm glad for your sakes I was not there. Because you know me to be a provider of food and you know me to be a healer. But did you know me as the resurrection of life? And you remember this? This is so powerful. Here's what I want you to remember. Please go back and read this. Enoch, excuse me, Enoch's death to me is parallel to Lazarus. Because you remember this, and you've got to grab this as a revelation. Martha came out to meet him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She knew he was a healer. But then watch this. But now that you hear, whatever you ask the Father, he's going to do it. You know what she was believing for? Resurrection. And then Jesus accompanied and said, okay, your brother shall rise again. But watch what she went to as a point of faith. I know he will in the resurrection of the last day, but that's not what you just asked for, Martha. You said, now that you are here, is he here now? And the answer is yes. The death that we are dying is like what Lazarus died physically without it being physical. You say, what, is, what do you mean, Pastor Brown? I could have walked up to Lazarus and said to him while he was laying in that grave there, man, I ain't never like you. Your mama, your brother, you know them sisters of yours, you make me sick. Was Lazarus going to respond? No. I could have walked up to him and told him, ever since I have known you, you always carried a little body on the Lazarus, and I couldn't stand to be around you. Was he going to respond? No. Why? Because he was dead. He was what? Dead. And when the one voice he could respond to, Jesus. While we are alive, we reckon ourselves to be dead. And what I want you to hear is please understand our job now is to help bring you into the prophetic relationship with the Lord, that you will understand that the prophetic grace that was given you through the Holy Spirit is to empower you as a people to see what he see and say what he said, so that you will be the generation that see what you say from him. We are the people who are designed by the Lord to come forth with a different testimony. I had a picture I was going to get Pastor Beverly to put up. As an apostolic, as a prophetic voice of the Lord, I remember this when the Lord told me to create this image. And I had a vision of me and Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I was, listen, I was close to I had rubbed all up against him. And when he was looking, I was looking. And I wanted to know what was on his mind so I could speak what he speak, say what he said. I wanted him to understand. Listen, I, I, I didn't, we didn't go deep to get next to you. And I'm not interested in what others in the world are saying. What are you saying in your word so that we can prove it? And Pastor Beverly has put that image up for you. And the intensity that you see there is when you dig deep, when you dig deep, you get next to it. And I believe that the call is for us in this Lions Conference to recognize, don't give up on prophetic voices and apostolic voices because of all the confusion we just walked through. I'm praying that the apostolic and the prophetic will dig deep and will align themselves. There used to be a simple song, do you see what I see? And, but I wanna say it from a different perspective. We must be as focused and as close to him as we can. Why? As apostles and prophets, we are foundational. And as I'm showing you, and I want you to see this picture, it's not just for me, it's for the body of Christ to know that as we're digging deep and bringing you into the full measure of your prophetic, priestly, and kingly ministry, this is the season that the Lord says, 
Don't be angry. Don't be frustrated with the prophetic and the apostolic that created so much confusion. Don't point your fingers in the negative. What you do is ask that the Lord will allow those unique forces to go down deep and find what he is saying now. Because our God is not giving up on our nation and our country, nor has he abandoned the Constitution, nor is he waiting for this president to be uh, removed, and there's nothing in place that will allow that. And what I'm submitting to you is I have no anger with, with the previous administration. I prayed for him the same way I prayed for every administration. But now our focus must be as sharp with the lion. And when he roars, you roar. When he speaks, you speak. Why? Because we're not trying to bring forth death. We're bringing forth the message of life through faith and its abundance. He sees what's on the horizon. He wants you to see. And he is going to show you what's of him and what's not of him. But we are so neat and necessary that I believe that one of the things you can do wherever you are in this nation is ask God those trusted apostolic prophetic voices that just in some ways, whatever happened, ask them to stop in your prayers and ask God to let them re-relate to that rock they dug deep once to find. I'm asking you this because the lion is roaring the mysteries of God. And there are so many things that we must bring you into relationship within this hour that I'm simply saying to you, I don't just believe it's a few voices. I believe God can recover all. He can recover all. And during this Lions Conference, I'm believing the Lord that you will hear the value of indeed why the apostolic and the prophetic is foundational. You will hear Bishop Jackson tomorrow give you a series of things that will bless you. And my introduction to this to you is to let you know you are a threefold core prophetic priestly king. And the apostolic and prophetic that God has called to dig deep and lay on that rock is now up face to face, eye to eye with him. And as we begin to roar, you'll hear the mysteries come forth and we're not taking the credit. We're just simply going to bring it forth so you will not walk on this earth in fear and intimidation as the unique challenges come upon this earth. I need you to receive this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to pray with me because I believe the Lord is speaking and he's speaking in such a way that he's preparing us to be instruments in his hands that will absolutely make a difference for this day and time we let us pray. Heavenly and most gracious Father, we do thank you that Lord, you have raised us up to be a threefold cord. Father, release the prophetic and the apostolic to speak into our lives to strengthen your body. Help us to behold the mysteries that you said would be finished that you've spoken by the mouth of your prophets in Revelations 10. Help us to know, Father, that you are awaiting in heaven, waiting for the restitution that you've spoken by the mouth of all your holy prophets that were spoken from the foundation of the world. And that indeed, according to Acts 3 and 25, we are your children and children of the prophetic. Help us to embrace it. There are things you said you wouldn't do except you first do it and speak it through your service to prophet. And it no more makes us usurpers of authority over pastors or evangelists or teachers, but help us to relate to the heavenly vision that we may teach others to dig deep and find the true rock. And as from an apostolic and a prophetic way, Father, help us to be aligned with the covenant of your promises in this day, that we may help the people to walk out of the spirit of fear, confusion, doubt, that they may see indeed who they are through the principles of faith. 
Help us as foundation, so much foundation, that Lord, you made the apostles a part of the foundation of the, of the pillars in heaven. Help us to recognize in this earth how you would dare use us to speak your voice of life and life more abundantly. Help us, Father, to minister confidence to your people that they may understand that though you said in Psalms 11, the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? But we are persuaded, my God, that nevertheless, the foundation of you are stand sure. Foundations that will never be uprooted. And Father, I condemn no soul, but I'm asking you in this hour, Bring forth the continuity of your voice to the body of Christ that we may awaken the many tribes and the unique character that they bring to the table. But awaken them in the true prophetic nature that you gave us when you gave us your Holy Spirit and told us we would prophesy. Awaken us in this time of transition to not be voices of confusion. Help us to take off our our tinted glasses, whereas many have, have not even been aware that they've spoken through tinted glasses. And may, Father, they get face to face, side by side with you and see what you're seeing, that we may say what we're seeing, that it never falls to the ground. I find no condemnation. But in this hour, Raise up the apostolic and the prophetic once again to understand the value of being with you. And that we may understand you are a fair and just God. That Father, and according to your words, we pray for this leadership in the White House and ask you to bless him with that, that Father, he needs to address sustaining him in what's right, and Lord, helping him and that that opposes your will. I declare that we will not continue for those in the spirit of Lucifer, an accuser of the brethren that are pointing with no remedy and solution. Forgive those who have entered into that mindset and spirit that don't understand. You do acknowledge this man as a leader of this nation. And the vice president is the leader of this nation. Though they may not accept all of your will, we must pray for them. And this spirit of divide that is coming against us, bring forth that we be silent no more. And without the spirit of condemnation, yet addressing by faith, we're on a path to overcome poverty, sickness, disease, and death through faith. And the enemy recognized that as a threefold cord, there's nothing he could do to prevent us from turning this world right side up. And ministering life where so many names have been given that are marked on people's forehead and their hands are bound to do the work. Awaken us. Let your voice roar out over the nations. May it disturb those who have lost themselves into mindset and agendas and may they begin to once again in order to build the house that is fashioned upon you dig deep and find you my god we are decreeing this healing must come forth healing must come forth in our nation for the spirit of divine father seeks to be a shedder of innocent blood and we will not give our nation over to this. It doesn't matter whether it's from the right or the left, we will not give our nation to the shedding of innocent blood. And as before, as under Barack and under President Trump and under this president, forgive those who all they can do is point and accuse with accusation even things that may be true, but does not change the scenario. Bring forth the prophetic words that we may prophesy and decree with life without the spirit of hatred. Again, remembering your word, 
ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. And even as we read in Timothy, those who may even oppose themselves, help us to be the instruments that will pray the prayer of faith and life, decree your word that others may come across them and walk in the spirit of your great revelation and love and power and demonstration. In Jesus' name, amen. My bishop. Bishop, I believe you're muted. Can you hear me now? Praise yes. God. Awesome. I want to thank Prophet Brock, praise God, for sharing such powerful instructions. And whenever God gives instruction, it's because he's constructing a condition whereby his will is coming to pass. I want to read something that God had given me uh, in in 2019 and it really the word that he shared about deep calls unto deep it really really struck my spirit and it's based upon psalm 42 verse 7 and 8 so you can write down psalm 42 verse 7 and 8 and it's deep calling unto deep and this is the groundbreaking of a new era uh, as he began to explain it to me. He said, we are born again with a longing for the deep of God. God sets the hunger for the eating and digesting the word and drinking from the relationship of the spirit. God has put a passion, a longing, a need for the more of God at any cost in our spirit. This is a deep that can only be contributed to God that's beyond human ability, that has been seen but never manifested, or that has never been seen, but it is the will of God. There must be a willingness to allow God to break up the deep that is in us that we may obtain to the deep that is the heart of God. God told me that he would make me comfortable being uncomfortable. We must concede the estate of personal comfortability without conceding the desire that God has planted in our heart. When God give us a conditional promise, it is permanent as we meet the requirements and stated for its results. Understand it's still not a performance base but by grace through faith operatives. Redefine the opportunities of disappointment into learning, growing, and development, and situations will go deeper in the will of God. God out of his deep calls us unto himself. This is a call to intimacy, nearness, closeness, inwardness, and to be present within the deep of God. And I'm gonna skip something to read this. When God calls us to his depth, it's as if the seas of the world is calling us unto their depth, but much, much more endless. The waters of the earth can be measured by man, but God is endless depth and unmeasurable. And there are four miracles that God put himself on display to help us view his endless death. The first miracle is the creation of the universe and all that it feels as it forever expands. The second one is God using the nation of Israel displaying his power through a small segment of the human race. 
The third one is God flexing and demonstrating his depth through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, the son of man, the son of God. And the fourth one is by the outpouring of the Holy Ghost to be on the front line and the cutting edge within those that are born of the spirit of God. Praise God. So we're living in that time. Caliph is really a trans, a transformational, transitional word, which means to command or to request to come and to be present. It's a summon. It's a call unto his servant. Praise God. And I just sense that tonight that God is doing a deep work in us and everything is just on time and on cue. On tomorrow night, yours truly will be sharing the word of God. We want to ask that you would pray uh, for the success of this Lions Conference campaign. But tonight is already successful. Praise God. God has accomplished his will for tonight. And this is the opening part. So it's going to get great. Praise God. And then on Saturday at 10 a.m., we have the prophetic table in which uh, we will have four prophets where all of them are apostles and prophets. But they're gonna share and go into depth on some prophetic things that is in the now, that is current, that uh, need to be addressed. And also we will have the question and answer period. I mean, so that you can ask your questions. So we wanna thank God for each and every one of you that have came. Now we're believing God for a total of 500 people. We can host 500 people per session. And so we wanna ask that you would encourage people to come to be a part of this. Praise God, because it's going to be awesome and it is awesome now, praise God. So thank all of our participants. Thank all of our students that came to receive the word of God. Wherever you are, we send our love. And I want you to remember this, praise God, as we get ready to release you for tonight. Uh, I want to thank all of our Apostolic Covenant family of ministry for your support and helping to make this successful tonight. All of the prayers that have went forth and been prayed, praise God, and God is moving and God is doing a great thing, praise God. Remember, our uh, central objective is loving to wholeness, supporting to security, and leading to maturity. That's loving to wholeness, supporting to security, and leading to maturity. Our motto is, we do life together, praise God. And our vision is based upon John 17, verse 21 through 23, praise God. So at that point, we just wanna say grace and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have a blessed night of rest. God give his beloved sleep, praise God. And we just wanna say God bless you. Everybody wave at everyone. Some can see you, some may can't, but we wave at you and say God bless. Praise God, at this time you can leave our webinar, Zoom webinar.